The Arab world's longest serving leader has died. Sultan Qaboos of Oman is credited with modernizing his country and in a volatile region, prioritizing diplomacy over division. So will that policy continue under the new monarch? This is Inside Story. And welcome to the programme. I'm Martine Dennis. Oman is mourning the death of a man who transformed the nation. Sultan Qaboos bin Said was 79 and had been ill for some time. Over the course of 50 years, he turned a poor country on the Arabian Peninsula into a modern state, which stayed diplomatically neutral in a region divided by conflict. Oman and several of its neighbours have now declared three days of mourning. Sultan Qaboos's successor was sworn in just a few hours after his death was announced. Haythan bin Tariq immediately promised to build on his late cousin's legacy. We remain guided by the late Sultan's wisdom going forward. We will preserve and embark on the achievements he made. This is what we are adamant to do, to follow in his footsteps. With respect to international relations, we will follow in the same course set out by the late Sultan. We will embrace foreign policies based on peaceful coexistence without any interference in domestic affairs of other states. All right, let's take a closer look then at who Haytham bin Tariq al Said actually is. A prominent member of the ruling al Said family in Oman, he graduated from the UK's two most prestigious universities, Oxford and Cambridge. Prior to his inauguration, he was a Minister of Heritage and Culture. He held that post for 18 years. The 65-year-old was also head of the Vision 2040 Committee, helping to develop Oman's economic and social strategy. We'll speak to our guests in a moment, but first, Rob Matheson looks back at Sultan Qaboos's life. Qaboos bin Said al Said was an only son, born in 1940 to a life of royal privilege and to a father he would overthrow 30 years later. Sultan Qaboos was educated in Oman and then at a private school in the UK before graduating from Sandhurst Military Academy and serving in the British Army for several months. On his return to Oman in 1966, his determination to modernize his country is said to have been ignored by his father. Four years later, backed by the British, Sultan Qaboos seized the throne. He was immediately plunged into his first crisis, an uprising by communists in Dofar in the south of Oman who wanted independence. It took a further six years before the fighting ended, with Oman being supported by forces from Britain, Jordan and Iran. Oman's links with Iran, as well as its foreign policy of maintaining good relations with other neighboring countries, have made it one of the main negotiators in the Gulf. That flexible foreign policy has been controversial. In October 2018, Sultan Qaboos met Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in the Omani capital, Muscat. The meeting dismayed critics, who said Arab states should not be hosting Israeli leaders until peace was established between Israel and the Palestinians. Oman's foreign minister said his country was simply facilitating efforts towards negotiations. Sultan Qaboos had rarely been seen in public since he went through lengthy medical treatment in Germany in 2015. He was unmarried and had neither children nor siblings, and he did not publicly name a successor. Time to introduce our guests now. From Muscat in Oman, we have Hushang Hassan Yari, Professor of International Relations and Security Issues at Sultan Qaboos University in Oman. Here in Doha, we have Luciano Zakara, an Assistant Professor of Gulf Politics at Qatar's University Gulf Studies Center. In Brussels, in Belgium, Guy Burton, an Adjunct Professor of International Affairs at Vesalius College. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us. Let's go to Muscat first. And Sultan Qaboos seems to have been universally loved uh, at home and respected abroad. Uh, absolutely. He was adored by his people, uh, despite the hardship that the country uh, 
uh, went through because of uh, the volatile situation uh, uh, in the region and the price of oil. But nevertheless, because of uh, his char charismatic personality and uh, uh, the uh, father of the nation, uh, he uh, was extremely uh, uh, respected by the people and uh, uh, for cause. Because uh, if you look at the time that he took over as, uh, as Sultan, uh, there was nothing in the country. There was one or two uh, uh, theological schools, uh, uh, nothing more than that. And uh, now you can find uh, many universities, uh, thousands of uh, students, uh, and also in terms of infrastructure of the country, he built the modern country. Uh, this is why uh, uh, the people uh, love him and uh, respect him. Uh, he created the new Oman. Right. And uh, Luciano, abroad, further afield, certainly in the Gulf region, I mean, there was a huge amount of respect for the man um, who many didn't seem to really know. He was pretty enigmatic because he didn't really attend meetings, uh, but nonetheless, his presence was always felt. Exactly. He was not very well known because of his uh, sympathy, but however, uh, he was respected as a ruler and he was respected as, as a mediator. He managed to... Uh, sit together people from every uh, every uh, corner of the world. I mean, uh, he was able to sit together United States and, and Iran. He was uh, fundamental in, in managing some issues regarding the GCC uh, current uh, crisis. He was also important in, uh, in uh, mediating in, in Yemen issues. Uh, and he, as, as, you, as you mentioned in the report, he, visit, he received the visit of uh, Netanyahu, who was very controversial on one point, but on the other hand, he, uh, it, it showed how uh, interested he was in uh, fixing uh, problems in the, in, in the Middle East using his own uh, charismatic way of uh, doing uh, foreign policy. Right. And uh, Guy, in Brussels, uh, many uh, describe his greatest achievement as being um, keeping, basically keeping his country out of the many conflicts that are raging in the region. Yeah, thank you for having me. And yes, that's certainly the case. I mean, he very much kept uh, you know, his country independent. And what's interesting is that in your report, you pointed out that his successor and cousin has made it very clear that the intention is to continue with uh, the non-interference policy, which seemed to serve the Omanis very, very well, especially in the current context in which you have you know, divisions within the Gulf and uh, Oman and Kuwait very much taking the position that they want to be sort of independent, to be sort of the, the people that uh, both sides can come to. And as your previous um, you know, contributors have also pointed out, this is also reflected in the fact that you know, the, what, the nuclear deal, which uh, the Americans have since walked away from in the case of Iran, you know, the start of that was very much uh, you know, helped by Oman hosting uh, the talks between the Iranians and the Americans. Right. And uh, coming back now to Hushang in Muscat, um, the Sultan Qaboos, I mean, he had a huge amount of power, didn't he? He was uh, not only the, the Sultan, the head of state, uh, he was the finance minister, he was the prime minister, he was the foreign minister, and he was in charge uh, of the armed forces. He also spent an awful lot of time outside of the country because of his uh, poor health. How did the country run with these great periods of absence? Um, it's fascinating what you say, uh, 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 despite all of those uh, responsibilities uh, uh, and uh, quite long period of time absent uh, from the country, uh, everything continued to run, to be run smoothly. It means that he was able to, with his colleagues obviously, he was able to put uh, in, uh, in place the institutions uh, solidly enough to uh, continue uh, working uh, despite his absence. Uh, and also because of uh, uh, his presence, even in absence, his presence in the country, uh, he, there was no uh, real issue uh, during, he, during his absence. So this is why, uh, uh, if you go back to those, uh, to those years, although the people were uh, a bit anxious to know what's going on in terms of his health, uh, but nevertheless, the respect was there, and the, the, the country uh, continued to work uh, very, very normally. So, uh, contrary to the situation in some other countries in the region uh, where the, the a number of leaders, they are hated by their people and the people are looking for opportunity uh, to uh, overthrow him, uh, he was absent and nothing happened. Uh, precisely because of the 
uh, respect of, because of the uh, love of his people. He was somebody who had a very clear vision for his country and for the region, and uh, consequently he uh, was able to uh, put uh, very uh, um, capable people around him uh, uh, as members of the cabinet uh, uh, and also those elected in Majlis Shore, Majlis Dora, and so forth. And consequently, uh, his absence uh, didn't have any uh, real impact uh, on the uh, daily functioning of, uh, uh, of the country. Right. Luciano, um, many people who've been uh, around the region, who visited Oman, will be immediately struck, won't they, at the difference of the tone and the feel of the country. It also uh, relies upon oil and gas uh, exports uh, for its uh, financing, but it doesn't have the sleek uh, skyscrapers that we can see behind you, Luciano, that are in other parts of the Gulf. It's got a completely different feel. Um, can you explain us culturally why that is, why it doesn't feel like the rest of the Gulf? Well, it's interesting because if, uh, if you discuss with expats in the in the GCC context, of course, they said that the Oman Oman is maybe the most genuine uh, GCC state that it preserve a lot of uh, tradition. Uh, and even though it became a modern country, it did not change the identity uh, of the of the country. This is based basically assumed that uh, because of the nature of the society, the Omani society, and also because the the, the lack of resources uh, that compared with the other GCC states made Oman to move towards modernity, uh, following more smoother path toward this uh, way of uh, building uh, uh, or constructing cities in, in a way that we can see in Qatar, Emirates, or even Saudi Arabia or, or Kuwait. Uh, and also because, I mean, as I said, the tradition, the traditional uh, way of life in, in Oman was preserved by the people. The, the way of uh, living of the Mani people is much more calmer than the other GCC states, uh, and this can be that can also explain the way in which uh, Oman is behaving at the international level. Uh, it's people that they they enjoy much more uh, the traditions. They are not involved, for instance, in the sectarian tension that exists between Sunnis and Shia in the whole region. They have their own uh, way of interpreting uh, Islam, which is Ibadism, that makes them make, makes them to be. Uh, more absent of all the, the, the tension that has been raised in the region lately. And Guy, I, I think we're getting a, a picture of Oman as being a, a place that is heaven on earth, but it's not completely that, is it? Because it's had its own brush uh, with uh, conflict within the country. I mean, 2011, when the region was uh, grappling with the, what was known as the Arab Spring, it had its own incident, didn't it? Yes, I mean, they were... Uh, not as uh, intense or as sustained as they were in other parts of the region. But it's, it's, it shows that uh, what was happening in, in Oman in 2011 was similar to what was happening in the rest of the rest of the Arab world and, and, and the Gulf as well. I mean, as, as your previous uh, contributors pointed out, you know, o Oman didn't, doesn't have the same level of hydrocarbon resources as the other parts of, of the Gulf. And so for that reason, it had to start looking at diversifying its economy a lot earlier than, than those other countries. It started looking doing that in the mid-1990s. However, the pace of that wasn't fast enough. And uh, obviously, it's not created sufficient numbers of jobs in other sectors, and especially for the young, which is why the, you had those protests taking place in 2011, and actually a couple that took place at the start of 2018 as well. So it's not completely smooth, smooth running for, 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 for the authorities in Oman. And certainly, you know, the new uh, sultan is also going to face that challenge of how do we diversify? How do we ensure that Oman is able to uh, have sustained and sustained growth and to be able to make uh, you know, improvements for, for its people? Right. And Hushang, um, we've already heard the first words from the new sultan, Sultan Haytham, and he's promised continuity. Uh, as the main uh, uh, deliverable, if you like. Um, does he have the vision, the vision of 2040, as he was part of that committee? Uh, and what does that, that vision look like? Um, I, I, as I said earlier, I believe that uh, uh, the new sultan is, uh, continue, is going to continue uh, the same way as uh, Sultan Rabus used to work for the country. Uh, this is why uh, uh, the, the, he, uh, his nomination or his appointment uh, is uh, received very, uh, um, very gladly, happily by the people. Uh, in terms of his experience, uh, again, he is a very experienced man, very, very well uh, educated. 
uh, and consequently, he was around this uh, Sultan Qaboos for the past many, many years. So in other words, uh, when you have somebody who is a source of aspiration uh, and able to transmit to uh, uh, his colleagues uh, the vision he has, uh, so it would be very uh, easy for the others to con to continue uh, the same way. And, and, uh, and uh, yes, Vision uh, 22, 24. Hushang, is, do we know that whether the, the yeah. new sultan is going to amass the same level of power and control as Sultan Qaboos? It's very difficult to, to, to say that at this very uh, early stage. But what is important is really, uh, even after, uh, under Sultan Qaboos, we can see a very incremental uh, move in the, uh, in the, uh, the direction of uh, more openness, more uh, democratization. So this is why, for example, uh, we had a very free and uh, uh, fair election at the municipality level. Uh, uh, recently at the Majlis Shura uh, Consultative uh, Parliament and, uh, and so forth. So it means that uh, the, the path is uh, uh, almost there, uh, ready to, to continue. And consequently, I believe that uh, Sultan Haytham is uh, simply continue to do what was started because contrary to some other countries where you see a rupture between the old and the new, uh, here uh, uh, there is a question of continuity uh, rather than uh, uh, stopping, shifting, changing uh, drastically the situation. And uh, uh, being in charge of uh, Vision 2040, which is basically uh, uh, to diversify the economy uh, gives him a lot of uh, uh, insight uh, to the function of, uh, of the machinery of the system. And uh, consequently, uh, he is the one, I believe, who can and he, who is able to, to continue and uh, to improve the situation and whatever was uh, started earlier. Right. Luciano, um, the news, uh, the sad news of the passing of Sultan Qaboos came in the early hours uh, local time in this region. Uh, um, it was just a matter of hours, wasn't it, before his replacement uh, was announced. You see that there's anything to comment on uh, with regard to the swiftness with which his successor was named and sworn in. Well, to be honest, there were some rumors circulating on, 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 on the internet that uh, he might have been died a couple of days ago. Uh, I mean, it will be difficult to, to, to say that, uh, that this happened and they were covering this until, until now to make sure that the appointment was done without any, any rejection or any, any controversy. Uh, but uh, as you say, it was announced and very uh, sharply it was announced the successor. Uh, I assume that in the current situation in, in which we are in the whole region, the lack of, uh, I mean, our certainty about who is going to rule or who was going to rule Oman was something that nobody wanted, and they made sure that everybody accepted and uh, everybody uh, uh, realized that there was a current um, a ruler uh, ruling the country immediately after the demise of, of uh, Sultan Qaboos. There had been always, uh, I mean, in the academic environment, a discussion about how the, the, the succession will uh, affect the continuity of the current uh, modern state, the unity of the country. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And now we are in a very bad uh, situation uh, with the confrontation between Iran and the United States. And I assume that having uh, the certainty that Haysam ha has been appointed very quickly and without any uh, controversy or any rejection from anybody within the, the political establishment is, is a good news uh, with guarantee a smooth uh, transition with acceptation of all the, all the monies. Right. And so, Guy, uh, given, given that, what Luciano has just said, uh, the speed and the efficiency, if you like, of the transition, um, can we therefore expect that this era of uh, uh, discrete diplomacy will continue? Well, I mean, that's the plan. And I mean, certainly, you know, it's been very made clear to try and get uh, a succession that was un, you know, undisputed, unquestioned, which is actually in contrast to what a lot of people assumed uh, before, uh, the, you know, Sultan Qaboos's passing. There was an assumption that it was actually going to be a lot more fraught than it is. Now, the big question, of course, is, you know, is the new Sultan going to be able to consolidate his position? Uh, but even if he does that domestically, I mean, the, the, the big challenge that Oman faces is that it is in a region which is quite volatile. So it is going to be buffeted around. It is not a country uh, that is particularly strong
along, that it has, that has a particular degree of independence in terms of its resources and, and patronage in the region. So, you know, its foreign policy and its approach to, take it, to taking this independent route is a way of trying to, you know, stand apart a little bit and to ensure that it isn't affected by, by wider regional turbulence. Right. And uh, coming back to Muscat and uh, to Hushang, uh, it seems very much as though Sultan Qaboos's first priority on taking over in 1970 was this uh, uh, undertaking to modernise the country. What needs to be the first priority then for the new Sultan, Sultan Haythan? I believe that the, the main challenge for the new Sultan is the economic situation, the price of oil is not what it used to be. Oman is a country like uh, the majority countries in the region uh, dependent on the oil revenue. And consequently, this is, uh, this is a challenge. But as uh, my colleagues mentioned earlier, as uh, uh, Oman started uh, its, uh, to diversify its economy uh, uh, some time ago, uh, and uh, I believe it continues to, uh, to do so. Uh, already we can see, for example, in the sector of tourism, uh, a big, uh, uh, the, um, a big move, a big change. So, so, Luciano, do you think, therefore, that given this promise and this uh, emphasis, if you like, on continuity, do you expect, therefore, that Muscat and Oman is likely to be the location of choice for any kind of back-channel negotiations that are going to take place? We, one would hope, especially when it comes to Iran and the U.S. Well, as I said before, I mean, uh, I was remarking in the, in the whole uh, show is that uh, Kabus was impressing his own personal way of doing uh, politics and foreign policy. Uh, and it's the way in which uh, Oman was mediating between the different conflicts and the way it, uh, Sultan Kabus kept uh, uh, Oman aside of any of the big tensions that they, they exist in the region uh, makes uh, difficult to, 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 to believe that Haitham will be able to do exactly the same. Of course, I, I, I believe that Haitham will try uh, his best to keep Oman uh, having this mediator role. But of course, we need to see how he's behaving uh, personally, because uh, it, it was much more related in the way in which uh, uh, Sultan Qaboos was impressed in his uh, uh, diplomatic style. Uh, the same as uh, we have to say about the internal politics. I mean, there are many challenges uh, for Haitham to keep the same kind of internal legitimacy, uh, keeping the country united, and mainly since uh, uh, Guy mentioned that um, that I mean there were some uh, moves towards democratization in the last since 2011 because there were demands for that, but the steps were very minor. So the next uh, the the current uh, uh, sultan needs to improve a little bit that more because it might be that having in mind that the that the current sultan is still in the way of getting his legitimacy from the population, he will need to address some of these demands for uh, more opening or more democratization in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the electoral processes, for instance, in the, in the Shura Council. Right. And Guy, giving the final word to you, if you could be brief, please. Um, we've had an indication, really, of the economic problems that are there and are certainly on the horizon. Presumably, job creation is going to be one of the most uh, pressing problems for the new Sultan. And that's got to form part of his diversification programme. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the big things which we haven't talked about yet is the, uh, the, the, the construction of the Dukham port and the special economic zone, which uh, about three, four years ago got funding from, from China and the Asian Investment Infrastructure Bank of around 265 million. The intention is that in a couple of years' time, that's going to open up uh, an indu in industrial park and enable a number of different sort of businesses and opportunities there. So it's going to be one to watch, especially when we think uh, about the role of China in the Middle East and whether that's going to be uh, influenced by, uh, you know, its e entry into Oman. Great stuff. Thank you all very much indeed. Hu Chang Hassan Yari in Muscat, Luciano Zakara here in Doha and Guy Burton in Brussels. Thank you all very much indeed. And as ever, thank you for watching the programme. You can see it again anytime you like by going to the website, aljazeera.com. You should know it by now. And if you want more discussion, you can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. There's the Twitter sphere as well. Our handle at AJ Inside Story. I'm at Martine Dennis. So from me and the whole team here in Doha, it's bye for now.